Welcome to the Western Theater in the Civil Wars, the Department Number Two podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the Western Theater in the Civil War. My name is Derek Lindo, and I am one of your hosts. Hello, I'm Daryl Smith. I will be your other host today. I'm stationed in Cincinnati. Where are you at, Derek? Uh, I am in Owensboro, Kentucky, for now. And uh, for now. yeah, for now. So we've uh, we'll be moving soon, but not too far away. <laughs> well, Daryl, who we got with us today? Uh, we have the redoubtable, the indefatigable. I'm going to just make up and slur words here as I go. Dan Masters, and and anybody listening to this particular podcast, if you don't know who Dan is by following his blog, um, you have done yourself a disservice. Dan is a prolific uh, blog writer, uh, variety of topics, mostly related to Ohio regiments, but far not always. So that not not nearly always. Uh, on a wide variety of topics in the Civil War. Uh, Dan's also uh, published a few books. I'm going to let him speak about that piece. Um, but Dan's based out of, well, I'll say Greater Toledo, Ohio. I don't know if anything's great about Toledo, but we'll say Greater Toledo, Ohio. The only thing is, is Ohio lost it in the, in the we lost the Ohio-Michigan War because we got stuck with Toledo and that little strip between Toledo. No, is that bad? That's bad, isn't it? Terrible. I had to go there. I had to go there. So, uh, but we've we've got Dan Masters. He's gonna he's gonna be our kickoff um, kickoff speaker or kickoff um, ho- or guest, I guess, for lack of a better term, into our episodes as we move forward. And we are excited to have him because he has a forthcoming book uh, on a battle that really needs more ink. To be blatantly honest with you, while there's a lot, and Dan will cover that. Um, the, Having a new perspective, particularly from the soldier's perspective, from what I understand, is going to be fantastic. So with that, I will be quiet. Dan, fire away. So, yeah, uh, thanks for the invite to come and uh, uh, be the uh, the guinea pig on the podcast. I appreciate sure. that. Uh, so a little, just a little bit of background on me. I'm a, a native, of, uh, as you said, the greater Toledo area. I live in uh, Perrysburg, which I refer to as the garden spot of the Midwest, uh, far more so than Cincinnati. Far uh, I agree. Uh, lived in the area my entire life. Uh, married for be 25 years here in August uh, to my wife, Amy. We have six children. We have two grandchildren now. Uh, so, you know, the family uh, continues to expand. But, uh, you know, one of my uh, uh, deepest passions is, is the American Civil War and particularly the Western theater. And Biggest reason for that is I am the descendant of five veterans of the Civil War, uh, all of whom served in the Union Army, and four of those five served in the Army of the Cumberland. So the 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 connections with uh, you know General Rosecrans' army and later General Sherman's army run run very deeply with me. And uh, thinking about Stones River, what really kind of kicked off my interest. You think, why would you pick Stones River of all, you know, all things to um, make such a major part of your uh, life study? Uh, It started off as a genealogy project. Um, I had an uncle on my mother's side uh, who served in the 21st Ohio Infantry with his brother. So there were two brothers that served together, uh, Uncle Jim and Uncle Jim and Uncle Fred. And Uncle Jim was wounded uh, severely wounded on the on December 31st, 62 in the Cedars and died about two weeks later in Nashville. And kind of learning about that, we, we had lost during the war, we had lost two family members um, during the war. He was the only combat casualty. The other uh, was an uncle on my dad's side who died of disease in Memphis. Um, but wanting to understand better what his experience was uh, that kind of you know, led to the end of his life. It really kind of kicked off this this fascination with Stones River, which once you get into it, it is a, a very fascinating battle. And, you know, a little, little surprise, there's not been more, more ink uh, uh, spilled about it, but uh, I'm sure Ted Savas will, will assure you, I've, I've spilled enough ink on this battle in this upcoming book that uh, um, I think we'll, we'll satisfy some appetites for a while. That's good. Um, I, we, we've talked about before, you know, just how excited we are about that book and just how needed a book on Stones River, uh, just the need for a book on Stones River that is like the one that you are going to be putting out there is just so important. 
Um, so one of the things we want, since we're talking about books there, um, tell us a little bit about the historiography of the Battle of Stones River, and because it seems like it's a little different than a lot of the other major battles. And um, in conversations we've had in the past, we've mentioned that how strange it is, how su there's such a gap in historiography. So I'll let you talk about that. So what is out there on Stones River and how is that going to be different than what you are putting out there? Sure. Uh, so the first book uh, about the Battle of Stones River was actually released in the spring of 1863. Uh, it was written by uh, William Bickham, uh, who was a, a staff officer with Rosecrans. Uh, uh, I think he was given a, 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 a I don't think he was ever commissioned, but he was he was given a, a an assimilated rank of a captain. Uh, but really, his main job was uh, he was he worked for the Cincinnati Daily Commercial, and was a reporter. And he wrote uh, a very detailed. Uh, account of the campaign, which was, as I said, I think it was the, you know, the, the campaign of the 14th Army Corps in the Battle of Murphy. So it, it, the, the title of the book is like 12 lines long. It's, it's insane. Um, but that, that book came out basically within months of the events happening. So it has some really interesting kind of scintillating details in it, uh, given that he was on Rosecrans staff and was a witness to a number of the different things that happened. Um, where it suffers, you know, from the standpoint of, of history, uh, it's very much one-sided. I mean, he, he gave the perspective of a, a, a federal staff officer. Of course, he had uh, minimal or no access to, you know, Confederate reports, Confederate accounts of this. So from a historian's perspective, it's a great first-person account. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a balanced, it's not balanced history. Right. Uh, the next book that came out was about 20 years later by Alexander Stevenson that was that had uh, pretensions of being a more all encompassing story of the battle. And once again, uh, uh, Stevenson, there, there's things that are great about his book and other things that are that, that are you know kind of problematic. Uh, he served in uh, Sheridan's division as the captain in the 42nd Illinois. And as a result, the, the portions of the book where he's talking about uh, particularly the actions of, of George Roberts' brigade, which he was a part of, are very, very detailed. Um, and it's clear that he interviewed some uh, Confederate veterans as well. He brings in some interesting uh, interesting accounts you really don't see anywhere else. Um, but as a, as a general history of the book, once again, it ends up being uh, pretty one-sided. Uh, very much, you know, the, the war, uh, the, the battle is viewed by Sheridan's division could be like the book's subtitle. Um, <laughs> but that said, that was the last book written about the Battle of Stones River until 1980. So we go almost 100 years. We go through the uh, the centennial period, the 1860s, where the, the, the for whatever reason, uh, the, the battle just did not receive, it didn't receive standalone treatment. It wasn't like, you know, Shelby Foote certainly didn't ignore it in his trilogy. Um, historians certainly were, you know, discussing this event, but for whatever reason, it just wasn't considered a uh, uh, an important enough topic. People tended to migrate to Shiloh and Chickamauga and Franklin and, and Stones River kind of got lost in the mix. I think part of the reason for that is it's one of those battles where either side could argue that they won and both sides could argue that they lost. It was mm -hmm. just, it was one of those, you know, we had so many of those battles during the war that were essentially toss-ups. Uh, Perryville, a, a, good, a good example. All right. Uh, the Confederate Army clearly did better on the field, but then overnight they retreat, which means the Union Army has possession of the field and hence the victory. So, I mean, you get you, and this happens a couple of times in the in the Western theater where you just have these um, uh, indecisive right. engagements. Now, Stones River wasn't an incredibly bloody indecisive engagement, but I do think that's in part why it's uh, not quite received the scholarly treatment in the past. Now that mm -hmm. said, starting in 1980, James McDonough came out with uh, uh, his book uh, about the Stones River campaign. I think it's called Bloody Winter in Tennessee. Yep, Bloody Winter in Tennessee. Um, and it's uh, you know here we are, 44 years later, it's still in print. 
mm -hmm. uh, which should give you some indication of how good a book it is. It is yeah. quite superb. Really the first book that came out that gave us a balanced uh, perspective on this battle, you know, using, you know, of course, the official records, but a lot of, a lot of really good Confederate and Union sources. Uh, about seven years later, Peter Cousins came out with his book, No Better Place to Die, uh, which is the book that, that, you know, when I first, um, you know, got in deeply into the study of the Civil War, uh, uh, I gobbled that book up. And yeah. it, it was something, it was a, it, it's still considered the standard work on the battle. Um, and of course, Peter Cousins wrote a, a trilogy of books about the war in the Western theater that um, uh, still were pretty well received. Um, but that came out in 87. I think University of Illinois Press put out a paperback version in 90. And then it was a few years until there was any more attention. Now, Lanny Smith in 2008 and 2010 uh, released his two-volume encyclopedia uh, about the Battle of Stones River. Now, the incredible books, I used them. Uh, they were a go-to resource for me throughout the writing process. Um not the kind of book you're going to curl up in your chair on a Sunday night, you know, with the fireplace going and opening up. It's, it's really a reference, yeah. but it's a superb reference. But that came out 2008 and 2010, I think, for the Confederate volume. And then Larry Daniels in 2012 came out with his Stones River uh, book. And I think the main thing that Larry's book added was a deeper examination of the political aspects of, of what the battle meant both north and south. And I think that really kind of advanced the ball there. So my my book, which will be coming out this summer, mm -hmm. uh, tentatively July, August, September, somewhere in that time frame, uh, is entitled Hell by the Acre. And it is how it differs from the previous accounts. Most of them, I'd say all of them, were kind of written more from a top-down, uh, more of a top-down strategic tactical kind of uh, perspective. Um, a lot of a lot of emphasis on what the general said happened. Uh, I'd say Larry Daniels' book probably goes the furthest with using you know firsthand accounts from you know the mm -hmm. men in the ranks. The kind of the approach that I took was I wanted to build up our understanding of the battle from the bottom up. Yeah. What did the privates and the sergeants and the you know the line uh, the line officers have to say about this engagement and. And, and to try to dovetail that better with, you know, using the OR and, and things like that. So it's, it comes from a very, it's, it's, it's a different perspective on Civil War combat. Um, uh, not a lot of emphasis. Uh, you, you might go, you know, read through the book. There's not a lot of lengthy passages in there about, you know, Generals Thomas Crittenden and McCook, and not a whole lot in there about uh, Lionitis Polk or Hardy or, really brag for that matter because for by and large the men in the ranks never saw these guys yeah you know their, their war was what they saw immediately in front of them and beside them so it's very much you know that that's the story of companies and regiments and the balance was to not get so far down in the weeds in telling this story that you lose the reader and mm -hmm. i think we achieved a pretty good balance there but it's it's a a pretty uh pretty amazing story when you get into it yeah, that's uh, the thing. One reason why I'm so excited about your book is you know, I've read a couple of those other ones and you know, I, I loved them, um, but they always had me wanting more when I was done. You know, not that they felt incomplete, but it's just, you know, I wanted more about especially what, what, with what you're doing, you know, bringing up the stories from the men who are having to actually carry out these orders. And I, I'm just I, I'm, I'm really pumped about that. So <laughs> I'm just Thank super, you. super excited. Now that we've got the historiography out of the way, let's talk a little bit about a little background on the Battle of Stones River. You know, why is a battle fought just outside of Murfreesboro, Tennessee? Uh, why do we have the Battle of Stones River? What, set, tell us a little briefly about the story to set us up here about sure. why sure. this battle so, happened. So for starters, just, you know, quick, you know, quick geography. Uh, Murfreesboro, for those who are not uh, aware, is now a, a burgeoning city of 100 50,000-ish people, uh, about a, a 30 miles south, southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. So located in the, um, in, in, close to the middle of the state. Uh, during the Civil War period, uh, it was Rutherford County uh, was uh, quite a wealthy county, uh, quite a bit of slavery in the area. 
uh, cotton. There was cotton grown. Uh, there was a, a mix of crops that were grown, but um, Murfreesboro was considered, you know, one of the, well, not the wealthiest area, but one of the wealthier areas, uh, of course, being in, you know, suburban uh, Nashville certainly helped. Uh, very much uh, secessionist in outlook. The, the local residents, uh, with few exceptions, were, were supporters of secession. Um, early on in the war, uh, actually by early March of 1862, uh, Murfreesboro is, is occupied by uh, Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio as they move south uh, in the aftermath of Fort Henry and Donaldson. So for a period of time, Murfreesboro, I think until about September of 1862, is under Union occupation. And really the reason we end up having this, this gigantic battle here in December of 1862 was because in August and September of 1862, Braxton Bragg and uh, Edmund Kirby Smith launched their invasion of Kentucky, which essentially moved the, the front lines of the war in the West from what were you know really closer down to Huntsville, Alabama, ultimately up much closer to Nashville. Now, of course, you know the Kentucky campaign went you know fairly close to Louisville. The Confederates got pretty you know with within a couple of days march uh, before backing off. Of course, there was the great race between uh, Buell's army and Bragg's army, uh, the Battle of Perryville, which is fought in October 8, 1862. Uh, really, by that point, Bra uh, Braxton Bragg, who was in command of the uh, that at that time, the Confederate Army of the Mississippi, would be uh, renamed uh, the Army of Tennessee once they arrived back in in uh, Murfreesboro area. Uh, was already kind of on his way out of Kentucky, having decided that you know if, if the Kentuckians were not willing to join uh, the Confederate Army in the numbers that uh, Bragg had been expecting. Uh, he really didn't have the logistical underpinnings to stay in Kentucky. And the, the Battle of Perryville pretty much cinched that, that, you know, it was, it was high time for the, for the um, Army to move back into friendlier territory. So they retreated back down to um, northern uh, Tennessee. Uh, of course, there was a lot of uh, hand-wringing in the uh, Lincoln administration that Don Carlos Buell did not pursue them more vigorously. And as a result, well, he was sacked and replaced by William S. Rosecrans. Uh, in the meantime, there was you know, quite a bit of, um, shall we say, hand-wringing in the Confederacy as well, uh, that this Kentucky, Kentucky campaign just it, it hadn't achieved what was expected, which was really the redemption of Kentucky. Uh, Bragg ends up going back to Richmond uh, to explain his posi position to Pre President Jefferson Davis and manages to keep his job and, and, and kind of convince Davis that he really did the right thing. And, but that said, uh, the, the army, after it gets to Knoxville, uh, goes all the way down to Chattanooga via rail, and then is transported via rail up to the Murfreesboro area, which was pretty much the extent that the uh, Confederate cavalry forces had recovered uh, Tennessee after Buell retreated. Uh, so what you end up having is the Confederate army uh, takes position in, in, a, in a, about a 30-mile line with Murfreesboro in the center, you know, facing generally north. There's kind of this uh, no man's land between them and the federal garrison at Nashville. Of course, Rosecrans uh, has his um, Army of Ohio, which is later the Army of the Cumberland, uh, move into Nashville in late November, not late, late October, early November. And you have this period of time for about a month and a half, month, month and a half, where the two armies are within 25 miles or so of each other and essentially foraging. Uh, they have these constant forage expeditions going out on both sides mm -hmm. uh, to sustain the armies. And, of course, there's a lot of uh, a con a real minor conflicts that occur during that time. But that's essentially how we end up uh, at Murfreesboro. It's really the aftermath of the uh, Kentucky campaign for both armies. Sorry, drop my questions. I'll cut that part out there. <laughs> All right, so if that's uh, so, that's how we get there. Um, what what finally pushes Rosecrans to start moving out of Nashville? Uh, if he's been sitting there for so long, uh, yeah. What eventually gets him moving? So, so to understand um, the condition that the Federal Army was in when Rosecrans took command, uh, they had retreated essentially 300 miles during the, the hottest part of the summer 
Uh, and the reason they had done so is because the Confederates, uh, especially the Confederate cavalry, uh, had done quite the job in destroying the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, uh, particularly Big South Tunnel at Gallatin, which essentially closed the Army's primary supply line. Uh, the Cumberland River, especially that summer when there was a drought, uh, the water levels on the Cumberland dropped such that you know, steamboat navigation was very problematic. So the Army was relying essentially on the railroads to you know, bring uh, foodstuffs and ammunition and clothing and whatnot. And a lot of effort had to be expended uh, after Rosecrans took command to repair all the damage that had been done to that line. It took 98 days to reopen Big South Tunnel. Um, reader or listeners that may not be familiar with that, in August 1862, uh, Darrell's favorite Confederate cavalryman, John Morgan, uh, had staged a raid on Gallatin and in, in the process essentially uh, uh, shoved a bunch of burning rail cars into the tunnel, which caught the supports on fire and the whole thing collapsed. So you have this this huge engineering project to, to basically redig this tunnel and then re-put up the supports. And it, it took like I said, 98 days before that tunnel was reopened, and that was uh, working on it uh, pretty much night and day after, you know, um, after no, uh, beginning of November. It was quite the project. But in the meantime, um, you know, Rosecrans is, is busy trying to, uh, you know, get his forces in place and build up a stock of supplies, uh, which by the latter portion of December, he has done that. Uh, he's actually built up enough supplies to keep the army uh, fed until February 1st, which is a, really a remarkable achievement. Uh, given in what a short time that it was accomplished. And really what finally kind of triggers Rosecrans to move, you got to understand that the December of 1862, the Lincoln administration has directed all of its armies in the field to uh, uh, engage in an offensive. Uh, we see that play out in the east at the Battle of Fredericksburg, which was a, a, a very regrettable disaster uh, for the Union Army. It plays out further in the West along the Mississippi River where uh, a grant, actually Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman under Grant's uh, direction, they've launched a two-pronged offensive on Vicksburg. Uh, grant to approach over, uh, overland moving south from, from Memphis, whereas Sherman would take uh, boats down and try to attack uh, Vicksburg uh, basically from the river uh, just north at a place that um, history remembers as Chickasaw Bayou, which has uh, uh, often been referred to as a Fredericksburg in the West. It was mm -hmm. a, uh, another, another case of you know, Union troops charging up against entrenched Confederates atop, you know, atop hills and fortifications. And uh, the casualty lists weren't as long as Fredericksburg. I think it was around 1,800 men, but it was certainly bloody enough, but it was another repulse. Mm -hmm. And the... In the, in the center, so you have the army in the east has fought, the army in the west, and Chickasaw Bayou essentially is going out at the same time as Stones River. I think the main battle is on December 29th, where Stones River proper uh, started the next day. Um, but the in the center, what really triggered Rosecrans that it was time to move out was not just pressure from the Lincoln administration and, and our, our favorite uh, Chief of Staff Henry Wager Halleck was certainly providing plenty of that. Um, but there was intelligence that had come uh, to Rosecrans that Bragg had dispatched uh, two of his primary cavalry forces on raids. Uh, one of those being uh, John Morgan, who engaged in you know, his Christmas time raid where he went up into Kentucky and raised a bit of a fuss. And the other uh, other cavalry force that was dispatched uh, was Nathan Bedford Forrest. Mm -hmm. uh, Forrest had a much smaller command, and he moved west. He moved more towards the railroads in western Tennessee, really to uh, to, uh, to undercut the underpinnings of Grant's offensive into Mississippi. Uh, Forrest raid in conjunction with Earl Van Dorn's uh, attack on Holly Springs. Uh, pretty much destroys uh, Grant's supply lines and really uh, halts uh, any serious effort of his to to you know advance on Vicksburg and then you know Sherman's kind of left 
uh, dangling on a hook all by himself down there, and that, that doesn't turn out too well. But Rosecrans staff, you know, of course, you know, and, and the other thing that just it, it amazes me, the the hubris of the Confederate Cavalry Command at this time. Uh, one of the things Joseph Johnston, who was appointed, you know, departmental commander in you know in this uh, uh, Western theater in late November of 1862, uh, Johnston, upon arriving at Chattanooga, is rather appalled to read fairly detailed uh, accounts of what the what Morgan's command is going to do later in December, uh, as far as where they're going to go and where they're going to raid. I mean, there, there was like no secret about this. Yeah. And of course, you know, as dullard as us Union folks may be on occasion, we certainly picked up on those Confederate news reports. Um, so Rosecrans in early December is sending messages after messages out to you know all his you know, detachments and outposts throughout Tennessee and Kentucky to be on the lookout for you know these Confederate cavalry raids. So when they finally got confirmation that they were actually occurring, it, it, the Union Army at this point had had raised hundreds of thousands of extra troops in the summer of 1862. A lot of these troops are now stationed to guard the supply lines throughout Kentucky, whereas in the sum the previous summer, those troops just hadn't existed. Yes. So now the supply lines are pretty well defended, and Rosecrans felt comfortable enough having built up this, this uh, you know, month excess of supply uh, that it was time to go after, um, after Braxton Bragg's army. Uh, the other piece that I know gets some uh, gets some discussion is that in mid December of 1862, Jefferson Davis comes and visits uh, the newly christened Army of Tennessee in Murfreesboro. There's a grand review. Uh, I think uh, John Morgan gets his stars and he gets married. I mean, it's all the you know all, all this. It's a show. Too. It's a show. And but one of the other things that Jefferson Davis was very very worried about was he was aware that there was going to be a federal offensive against Vicksburg and looking at it from the perspective of, you know, of, of, of a you know, national commander in chief, uh, he's looking at it and, you know, the, the, the thought seemed to be, well, you know, Rosecrans doesn't appear to be in too big of a hurry to come out of, out of Nashville. Maybe he's gone into winter, winter camp. Uh, we really need, you know, we need some reinforcements in Vicksburg and he prevails upon, on Bragg. I mean, really it prevails. He just tells him, hey, we're going to take Carter Stevenson's division and send it to Mississippi. Uh, Bragg is not real thrilled about this idea, uh, understanding that, you know, he would be, uh, could be significantly outnumbered if, you know, Forrest Kranz decides to, to uh, sortie out of, out of Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Davis gives him basically gives him a pass and says, you know, fight them if you can and fall back to the Tennessee if you must. And that's an important uh, strategic direction for people to keep in mind when thinking about Stones River. Uh, was, was Davis basically had already given Bragg a pass to retreat if he felt that he had to. Right. Uh, when you look at the, you know the results of the Kentucky Kentucky campaign, may, may not have been all that people expected. But they were successful moving the front line about 100 miles north from where it was in yeah. July of 1862. That was a lot of Confederate ground that was recovered uh, under Bragg's uh, guidance. Right during harvest time, too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Very important, um, which is you know, kind of also why the armies are where they're at. When the Federal Army left central Tennessee in August and September of 1862, it was the very beginning of harvest season. So both armies are gone when most of these farmers are reaping in their crops. Now, when the armies show back up a couple months later, uh, harvest time is over and they have a bumper crop. Mm -hmm. And the armies aren't shy. Both armies are, are, are eager to get their hands on those supplies. And and they do. But that said, so once that's I was talking about Carter Stevenson. His division leaves right about the time these two cavalry uh, expeditions depart. Interestingly, uh, Rosecrans doesn't learn about Stevenson's departure until about December 29th, three days after he started marching. So Stevenson's departure did not play a role in his decision uh, of one to march on Murfreesboro. 
but the the departure of, of John Morgan and Nathan Bedford Forrest certainly did. And I think Rosecrans' thinking was, well, with the Confederate cavalry whittled down uh, just by these detachments going out as far, as far as they were, he had less to. Uh, he was less worried about you know, protecting his supply lines in the rear. He knew that he had an advantage in infantry. Certainly had an in, an advantage in artillery, and he, you know, he was under pressure from from Washington to, you know, kind of get on the stick and get on with the war here. So there was a number of things that all kind of came together at the same time to get the army on the road. Does Rosecrans ever give any, like, does he have a source out there or anything where he gives um, his thoughts on Bragg losing Stevenson's division? Does that give him a little bit more hope for some success? Or Like I said, it, it was not a factor in his decision to move out. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, there, uh, Beckham mentions... Uh, in a dispatch that he writes to the Cincinnati commercial on the 29th, that that, that, in, that intelligence had just come in. Uh, but as I said, by this point, Rosecrans is poised on the outskirts of Murfreesboro already. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, the, there were um, spies on both sides mm -hmm. um, that were supplying information. William Truesdale in Nashville certainly had his network of of spies throughout the region, and there was Confederates throughout the region. So uh, both sides had um, information about the strengths of the others. Their, their estimates were, in, in this case, were, were pretty reasonable. Uh, Rosecrans expected that he'd be fighting something on the order of 40,000-ish troops uh, at, at Murfreesboro. He actually ends up fighting like 37,000, so mm -hmm. fairly close. Uh, Confederate estimates went anywhere from Fifty to seventy thousand, depending on which account you read. They actually fought about forty-five thousand, so they they weren't that far off. That's mm -hmm. um, not to say they had detailed information about you know every single unit that was uh, that they were facing, but they, they had a, a general a general idea. So yeah, that the news that Carter Stevenson's division had departed. I'm sure it was welcome news at Rosecrans headquarters. Well, our job's that much easier. There's, you know, X number of thousand less uh, uh, Confederates than we have to fight. Right. All right. So, Dan, um, I think most of us, uh, we've realized over the years that Braxton Bragg kind of gets a lot of blame for the Southern failure in the Western Department, uh, in the Western theater. Um, you know, going back to your commentary about, you know, the Confederates have recovered about 100 miles of territory. Well, Bragg is, you know, the invasion of Kentucky, which, you know, that's, that's a whole other topic of conversation. But that also prevents the fall of Chattanooga for well over a year. And I think that's something that many uh, folks kind of gloss over. Yeah, yeah. Remember, Buell, Buell was knocking on the door of Chattanooga yeah, in July absolutely. of 1862. He was not that far away, about 25 Not at all, with, you know, three or four divisions strung out across northern Alabama, in Southern Tennessee, that was a true threat to to Chattanooga, which then, of course, is the gateway to the Deep South, at least towards Atlanta. Tell us a little bit about Mr. Braxton Bragg at Stones River. So Braxton Bragg at Stones River. Uh, Braxton Bragg is, I think, unfairly saddled with the onus of, you know, being uh, uh, the, the author of so much of the South sorrows. Um, he was not it, it, he was not a terrible field general, although there was elements of his character that were certainly uh, uh, I won't say repulsive, but not too far from. A uh, very difficult man to work with. Uh, he had a notorious temper, um, tended to hold a grudge. On the other hand, he was also extraordinarily devoted to duty. He was thoroughly committed to the cause. Uh, his health was such that he probably never should have been in field command. I uh, really re belonged in a hospital, not not in command of an army. But it gives some some insight into the character of the man. And even with that going on, he's still in the field doing his duty, which is you know more than one could say for his predecessor, Mr. Beauregard, who checked himself out for his rescuer without even so much as clearing it with his superiors. So there's there's a, a bit of a con. A compare and contrast there. Um, so Braxton Bragg comes down to us as a historical figure, is really kind of a, 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 a miserable failure. And I, I think that 
it's an unfair characterization of him. And part of the problem that we run into with Braxton Bragg is understanding kind of historiography how how he's presented to us. And for for many of us, you know, we're all familiar with Sam Watkins' Company H, uh, which is a fantastic memoir of the Civil War. For a lot of folks, that's that's like their key introduction to the Army of Tennessee. And Sam Watkins is decidedly an anti-Bragg man, and he's very clear about that throughout the book. Is you know, he, I think he calls him a whipper of men and uh, a tyrant and whatnot. Um, and there was a block in the army, uh, the Tennessee block, uh, primarily that the the troops that served under Leonidas Polk, you know, uh, Polk's corps. Uh, that had this rather dim view of Bragg as a general, but there are other portions of the army, especially uh, Jones Withers Division, uh, which had served under Bragg's command at the very outset of the war down on the Gulf Coast, had a much more favorable view of him. So, you know, the, 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 the true opinion of Bragg as a soldier that, you know, historians have tended to, to focus on the nice, juicy, nasty quotes that uh, the soldiers are tearing this guy down and sometimes don't really balance it with the ones that, you know, have positive things to say about mm -hmm. Bragg. Um, you know, kind of the contrast between Bragg and Joseph Johnston. Um, popular conception is, well, Bragg was just, you know, uh, executing these guys left and right for desertion and this, that, and another thing. And I think Dave Powell's research with his, you know, upcoming uh, Atlanta was a five-part series. I was about to say trilogy. It's like, I don't know what's a five-part series. It's tr tremendous. We're excited about seeing. Ontology. But, but he has, you know, you know, makes the point that you know Johnston had far more men shot in a far shorter amount of time than Bragg ever did. But you never, you don't hear the Confederate veterans complaining about yeah. that. Um, one of the comments was also, you know, there was a bit of a clamor to get Bragg back in command after a couple of months. Bragg was considered a, a better feeder, which, you know, and, and, oh, that's not important. Well, yes, it is. If you're, you know, going on three days of rations a week instead of seven, you're going to get tired of that after oh, yeah. a while. And that was something Bragg was generally very good at doing, making sure that his men were uh, well supplied, uh, well fed, and overcoming a lot of logistic challenges to do that. Uh, so from the standpoint of like, you know, is Bragg a great guy? Is Bragg a guy that you want to go to work for? Probably not. But was he as right. bad as he was made out to be? No, I, I don't think yeah. so at all. Yeah. And his job at Murphy's where once again, understanding what Davis's uh, directions to him were in the middle of December was fight them if you can and fall back to the Tennessee River. So it, it was very much it was a def he was put in a defensive posture, which is a bit Against his nature, Bragg tended to be a, a, a touch more aggressive and wanting to kind of take the war to the enemy. And he really didn't have the means to do that at Stones River. Mm -hmm. uh, so his job is that very much of, of being on the defense. And his way of, you know, his way of fighting a defense isn't to just hunker down on some fortifications on Wayne's Hill at Stones River and just wait for uh, Rosecrans to come to him. He sees an opportunity. Uh, developing on December 30th with with McCook's Corps kind of coming in into the Union right wing, and he decides to go on the offensive. So we'll kind of you know a very yeah. interesting psychological study. Yeah. So so Dan, um, when you talked about he and Davis, you know Davis tells him you know fight him if you can, retreat if you have to, and that's okay. Is that is that because they're just such good friends? <laughs> well. <laughs> I had to say that. Okay, everybody, I want everybody to pause. I want everybody listening to absorb this next section. Because you need to understand the actual history. They have a, a complex relationship, to say the least. Um, I believe that relationship improved over time during the war. Certainly after Bragg was... Uh, uh, I believe he resigned. His, he asked to be relieved after Missionary Ridge mm -hmm. and his resignation was accepted. Um, but he goes to Richmond and essentially serves as, as, as Bragg or as uh, Davis's close military advisor. And I think it, their relationship does grow closer at that point. Understand that, you know, before the Civil War, uh, Braxton Bragg did not consider Jefferson Davis a particular friend. 
uh, as a result, uh, really, in a way, he kind of viewed him as is part of the part of the uh, part of his problem and why he resigned from the army in I think 1855. Um, you know, Bragg was a, a dedicated art, uh, man of the artillery branch and had a number of reforms that he was trying to push through. You know, the army bureaucracy. And who was Secretary of War that was denying all these reforms? It was Jefferson Davis. And Bragg eventually got tired of being stymied enough. And, and given that he, he had married extremely well, his, his wife was a, uh, a very charming Louisiana woman, uh, a widow who had a, a six-figure uh, dowry that came with that marriage. Uh, so Bragg didn't have to, he didn't, have to, he didn't have to work for a living anymore, mm -hmm. really. <laughs> uh, from the standpoint of, you know, needing his army pay. But he, he was very frustrated with army politics and frustrated with, you know, kind of uh, how Davis had treated him. And he resigned and, you know, Davis, of course, accepted his resignation. So I uh, the characterize the relationship of these two men as, as friends, I think, stretches it a bit. I think their relationship was more proper um, than warm. Right. Now, a different story with Lionidas Polk and Jefferson Davis. There's no doubt that, that Jefferson Davis considered Polk a close personal friend, uh, such that he tended to overlook uh, Polk's, uh, shall we say, command deficiencies and kept him in command uh, far beyond his usefulness um, and really tolerated a lot more uh, chicanery and, and nonsense from Polk than you would expect. But once again, uh, these two men were personal friends that had gone back a lot of years and, you know, Davis uh, really couldn't see past them. But yeah, I can, can think that, that Davis and Bragg were uh, buddy, buddy and exchanging Christmas cards is, is I, I don't think quite true. Um, but that relationship did change over the course of the war. You know, of course, uh, Davis makes multiple visits to the army of Tennessee always to go and go and, and deal with what, what, what appears to be command problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Bragg's not getting along with Hardy and Polk. Bragg's not getting along with, you know, it, it, it goes on and on and on. You know, there's this the meeting in December. There was a meeting a month and a half later in January to, to deal with all the, you know, the outcry within the officer corps after Stones River. There's a meeting after Chickamauga. I mean, like I said, it's just, it's a recurrent theme that, um, you know, there's command issues within the Army of Tennessee, and I, I can't imagine that Davis doesn't get, you know, the, the one constant here is Braxton Bragg. Mm -hmm. Braxton well, Bragg is get along with all these people. Yeah, there's another constant, the United States Polk. So, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Who was, you know, the other spreading yeah. the anti-Bragg gospel wherever he yes. could. And there's Very a letter. Effectively. I think when you look at it, you know, historically, when you look at Bragg's reputation, how good of a job did Polk do at destroying his reputation? Look how he's viewed today, 160 yeah. years later. It's, uh, I, you know, I, I know some authors, you know, Earl Hess in particular, been, uh, whose biography of Bragg is fantastic, uh, are starting to kind of chip away at that um, um, uh, shade job that uh, Polk um, uh, did on Bragg. Once again, Bragg doesn't help himself a lot because of the, you know, kind of a, a prickly, uh, r raspy individual. Um, but yeah, I, I, I Polk won that war, mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, long-term reputation. Yeah. There's a letter you mentioned Hess's bio and brag, which much like what Derek said earlier, it actually left me wanting more. Cause I don't, there's some pieces there. I wish he could have even brought more into that story, but there's distinctly one of the letter that Bragg does send to his wife, at least early, early in the war when Bragg, I think, is serving in the Gulf. And, it's, it, you know, paraphrasing that, I, I don't think Davis likes me. So it's, you know, there's yeah. a business relationship, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I, say, I think that I think the relationship formal. between the men, uh, yeah. those two could be called more proper. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I mean, the commander in chief with one of his senior, senior generals, I mean, you, you, there's going to be some deference there. Um, but yeah, not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, Dan, with the Army of Tennessee, it seems like it has a lot of drama in the upper levels of command. Uh, you don't really see a lot of that, at least to my knowledge, in the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, does that sort of 
bickering among the top leaders, does that does that have any real impact on the Battle of Stones River and and how things play out? Um, from the standpoint of of do the generals on the field do their duty? I I, I didn't see any evidence that um, that the command politics played a major role uh, in the outcome of the battle. I mean, really, it this like Chickamauga. Mm-hmm. And like really so many of these battles fought in the Western theater, these are really soldiers battles without a whole lot of high level generalship going on. There's not mm-hmm. a lot of grand strategic sweeping movements and whatnot. This is really a bare knuckle slobber knocker type fighting. I mean, and you know, a, a lot of times it's the enemies in front of you. You got to go punch through them. Uh, so mm-hmm. there's not a lot of opportunity for uh <laughs> the kind of command politics to uh, impact the battle itself. Did they impact the aftermath? Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, as, as we cover in the book, you know, the, the Confederate army retreats on the night of January 3rd under the advice of nearly all of certainly the, the core commanders, Polk and Hardy majority of the divisional commanders, there was actually a, a message that was sent, uh, to brag the night of January 2nd uh, from General Jones Withers and Benjamin Cheatham, stating that out of the 20 brigades of the Army, only three were considered reliable. Months later, they found out really what they meant to say was that three out of the five divisions were reliable, not three out of 20 brigades. So it was it, the, the message got garbled, but the message Bragg's getting from his own commanders is, you got three brigades that are going to stand and fight here, and the other seventeen are, are going to cut and run. Mm-hmm. What would you do? Yeah, that, that that you know. And as I said, that and you see it in in the correspondence in the OR. This isn't cleared up. That 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 statement isn't cleaned up for several months. Right. So, but what happens is uh, the uh, sneaky little dog, Theodore O'Hara, who's attached himself to John Breckinridge's staff, starts leaking out information, uh, I think primarily to the Mobile papers, that Bragg had retreated from Stones River against the advice of his generals, which was a complete false statement. Mm -hmm. And that kicks off Bragg basically, you know, sending out this circular to his commanders in January in which he asked a couple of questions. A, did you recommend that I leave? And, you know, if I no longer have the confidence of the army, let me know. Well, it's not a good idea. They, <laughs> they kind of gloss over the first question and almost to a man, they come back and say, yeah, you don't have confidence in the army anymore, which really wasn't what Bragg intended to ask, but that's, I guess it just, it blows up. And, and really it, it, it's a really ugly scene. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the command, the, the issues with, uh, command in the Army of Tennessee or, or Legion, uh, it really comes down to you've got his two primary subordinates, uh, Polk and Hardy, um, are both actively working to underman- undermine Bragg's standing within the Army, pretty much seizing on any little mistake he makes, blowing it way out of proportion. Um, and it's it, very hard for anyone to be successful when, when, when the key members of your own team are working against you. Mm-hmm. And Bragg had limited uh, uh, ability to, uh, dis- uh, like in the Army of Northern Virginia, if, if a general did not meet Lee's expectations, Lee found a, a general way to get him sent elsewhere, reassigned. Uh, Bragg really struggled with that. There, he, Now, Shortly after he took command, he this is back in June of 62, he was able to get a few of these generals reassigned. But the key ones that he really wanted to get rid of, really wanted to get rid of Polk. He mm-hmm. wanted to get rid of Polk, and Cheatham was another one that was on his uh, undesirable list. Uh, John McCown uh, was another divisional commander, was another one. And he was never really given... He was never given the, the ability to clean house the way that Robert E. Lee could. Uh, you know, after the seven days uh, mm-hmm. battles, uh, really kind of reshuffling his command to really more suit his his vision for the army. Bragg was pretty much he, he was stuck with the team that he had, and he fouled the nest with these guys pretty pretty badly. And it's just like I said, it was a, just a really ugly ugly command situation. Yeah, it, it that's the thing. It's you know people. 
you know, these modern, I guess you call them armchair generals, saying, you know, they should have replaced Bragg. Well, with who? Yeah, w- with who? <laughs> and that's that's the problem we run into all the time in the Western theater. If not Bragg, then who? Yeah, not Polk. RD, who didn't want the job. Right. Polk, who had no business in the job. And not only that, Jefferson Davis knew that Polk had no business in that job. He never would have appointed him. Well, you could have put Claiborne in. Well, Claiborne in December of 1862 is a fairly freshly minted divisional general who never rises above divisional general because uh, as talented and, and skilled as an officer as he is, he, he has uh, you know the, the strike against him of being an Irishman, uh, yeah, being an Arkansan. Uh, not being particularly wealthy and without really any major political sponsors. Now, on also that, not, a, not a West Pointer. Not a West Pointer. That's and just right. a couple he months before, a, he'd been commanding a brigade. So, exactly. You know, it's here. I mean, he so, had his division experience at Richmond for just a few hours during that battle. Yeah, he got yeah, caught. Yeah, so, he, so he got <laughs> shot. Um, I said, not, and I don't see these things to take away from, from Claiborne's reputation as a field soldier. It's certainly w- one of the best, if not the best in the army of Tennessee, mm-hmm. but not that, that is not something that the Confederate, uh, high command is going to stomach is putting uh, a, a junior division commander in charge of the army. Uh, well, what about Joseph Johnston? Well, Johnston technically had command of a couple of armies in the, in the West. I mean, certainly Bragg's army was one. Uh, Theophilus' Holmes' uh, army, I think, well, no, he wasn't. There was just, there, there was some discussion about that, but then there was Pemberton's army outside of Vicksburg. So he, he was more of a, almost like an army group commander. Mm-hmm. So he's like a level above that. Now, he eventually, you know, does take command of Army of Tennessee at the end of 1863, beginning of 64. Uh, you know, the other uh, other options are Beauregard, and I guarantee you Davis was n- not going to give Beauregard no. a second chance after the stunt he pulled in June of 62 with this rescuer. That that really angered Davis, and Davis was not one to forgive and forget. No. So, you okay, if they're not brag, then who? Well, the, the two primary candidates within the army. Hardy could probably do the job, but didn't want it. And wouldn't, when offered later in 63, wouldn't take it. Mm-hmm. And then Polk, I can only imagine how that would have gone right. uh, with Polk in command. I guess Polk was really the only other option, but I think Davis knew that that was, that was, he was already kind of cutting above his level as a Corps commander, uh, let alone an army commander. Just, it wouldn't have worked out. Yeah. So, yeah, there, I'd say we're almost, it's, it's almost Bragg by default. And interestingly, Bragg himself really didn't want the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he was appointed to Army Command in June of 62, he actually sends a note to Beauregard. It's like, I really don't want this. Yeah. And knowing what, you know, the pressures and the challenges, knowing the health problems that he had, but, it, you know, his sense of duty. I think it goes back to his, his character. And like I said, he, Bragg might not have been the nicest guy in the world, but he certainly has some admirable qualities about him, certainly when it comes to his devotion to duty, uh, his, his belief in the cause, and what he was willing to sacrifice to, to, to make that a success. I mean, this was not, I don't get the sense this was like the, the height of his personal ambition to be an Army commander. I, I, I kind of get the sense he was kind of miserable in the job, and it shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we've got all that drama going on in the Army of Tennessee. Uh, what's going on with uh, Rosecrans and some of his senior commanders? Yeah, I, I, very much the opposite. Uh, this portion of the war, Rosecrans very much is in the honeymoon phase with the Army of the Cumberland. Um, very much a contrast in command from uh, Don Carlos Buell. Uh, Buell to the men. Um, Buell was a bit standoffish, rather cool. Um, didn't do a lot to really kind of stir up their enthusiasm, really kind of came off as a cold fish. Yeah. And very much, uh, you know, a West Pointer through and through, as was Rosecrans, um, but expected the regular army level of discipline. And the men, you know, remember, these are free thinking volunteers that they're, they're here to do a nasty, dirty job. And the less Mickey Mouse, the better. 
and Don Carlos Buell and his and his staff were all about the Mickey Mouse all the time. I mean, I, I, well, you took those onions out of Farmer Jones' backyard, you're going to get Doc 30 days pay. Mm-hmm. And the guy's like, you haven't given me rations in two weeks, and you're busting my chops about stealing some secessionist onions? Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. So that you know, kind of points to how <laughs> Buell's Ah, uh, command efficiency has eroded over time because this, you know, uh, interesting little nugget about the Battle of Perryville. Um, the day before, on October seventh, uh, Buell uh, is knocked off of his horse when he tries to charge a, some stragglers, and they grab the reins of his horse, and his horse throws him, which is in part why he's injured and not really on the field on October eighth when all the action's going on. He's back in his tent nursing this injury. So just another example, like I said, Bre- uh, Buell ultimately was not a good fit for the army that he led. Mm-hmm. Rosecrans, on the other hand, is far more gregarious, uh, has this uh, uh, almost McClellan-esque, and I say that with all the positive of spin <laughs> on McClellan, uh, this Mc- McClellan-esque uh, ability to get men to like him. Um, he took a very deep interest in, in, you know, whatever, you know, he, he would, ret- a simple thing, uh, if a private soldier would salute him, he would return the salute. That's something Buell never did. And the men noticed that it was a very yeah. small thing, but it, to them, it meant a great deal. Uh, Rosecrans was always very interested in the details. Um, you know, when he was doing inspections, he'd go up and down the line and he, he would seriously check every man's equipment. And if, if one of them was missing something, uh, how come you don't have a canteen? Well, I asked for one of my captain get and didn't get it. And Rosecrans like, no, 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 you need to, you need to keep rousting your captain and he'll roust his, you know, the quartermaster and eventually they'll roust me and I'll make sure you get, but you know, this idea, he was intimately interested in the lives of his men and they mm-hmm. really responded to it. Really the yeah. The remarkable turnaround in morale in the Army of Ohio between uh, Buell's departure and when this army marches out in December of 62 is is rather stunning. Um, yeah. and, and they maintained this high morale for really much the rest of the war. He really, uh, like you said, like McClellan did with the Army of the Potomac after First Bull Run and getting these men to believe in themselves again. And... The other interesting thing was about Rosecrans. You think he would be maybe a little less uh, less strict on discipline than Buell? He was actually stricter, and the men liked it. It yep. was all in the approach and how you did it. Yeah. Um, and granted, too, they were veteranizing. They were getting you know uh, more experience and more understanding. Of, okay, well, us being a, a a well-disciplined outfit is very helpful on the battlefield. So. Maybe this isn't such a bad thing after yeah. all. Whereas with Buell, there was, a, you know, it was almost like your teenage years. You rebel against your parents' authority, even you know you might intellectually know it's right. You still want to just rebel anyway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Buell was, you know, this kind of stern father during this period, whereas Rosecrans was more like the fun uncle that you got, you know, later yeah. on. Yeah, um, the, Buell did not seize on his success at Shiloh because the men after Shiloh, if Buell was coming down the road, they lustily cheered for that man. They did. And they he, did. Oh, he, he, he didn't he, really yeah. respond. He didn't. Yeah. It was that, unmilitary. That's his the, 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 yeah, the, he viewed the the men's response as unmilitary, and yeah, he just he couldn't see the forest through the trees. And it was the difference between leading regular troops and leading volunteers. They, they different motivations, different things get them moving. Uh, we were talking, you know, I'm not, got, I don't want to do. I didn't want to go too far down the weeds on Mr. Rosecrans, but it's kind of important to understand his 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 impact on the army, uh, his relations with his immediate subordinates. In in stark contrast to Braxton Bragg, are universally quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, the relationship, especially that he develops with George Thomas, it, it about the most beautiful command relationship you could see. J- Thomas and Rosecrans were, were I would say polar opposites in 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 character and what, but they were, they complemented each other very right. well. Uh, yeah. And Thomas had the, the, almost to the, to a man had the respect of the army. And once the men knew that, that Rosecrans was good with Thomas, well, Rosecrans is good for us too. I mean, they, they trusted uh, Thomas a, a, a great deal. Uh, mm-hmm. But that said, Rosecrans and Thomas got along uh, famously. 
Um, the other two core commanders that Rosecrans had was uh, Alexander McDowell McCook, uh, a very young man, another Ohio one, but only, I uh, think, 31 years old at the time of Stones River. Uh, pretty young to be in core command. Mm -hmm. um, some, some would offer he was probably a bit uh, out of his depth. He had proved to be a very good brigade commander and a pretty solid division commander. I uh, didn't quite do so well at Berryville. Uh, his wing would have a lot of problems at Stones River. Seems to be a bit of a pattern there for. Uh, There's a bit of a pattern there, um, but that said, he he got along pretty well with with Rosecrans and Thomas Crittenden, uh, who was uh, Rosecrans' other corps commander, commanded the left wing. Uh, also got not maybe not quite as Mormon chummy as as, as McCook, but you know McCook it, it, he comes down in history too as just kind of like this roly poly. Uh, Elmer Fudd type figure. He was enormously popular within the officer corps. He was uh, McCook's uh, headquarters was the social center of the army. Um, now I might have been they they drank harder there and told better stories. I'm sure they did than Thomas. You know Thomas was kind of a you know a pat. He wasn't called Pat for nothing. He, he mm -hmm. wasn't, that wasn't his scene. Uh, and I don't think that I don't think McCook could could drink. Uh, Crittenden under the under the table, but Crittenden was a more of a a, a Kentucky gentleman, as yeah. you know, we say. Whereas I think McCook was a little more uh, party oriented. It, mm -hmm. it, it maybe one would expect in a thirty one year old versus somebody that's in their forties. You do tend to you know a sober a bit with with age. And um, but that said, uh, Rosecrans is in this honeymoon phase uh, with the army, and there are no command um, cohesion issues at this point that mm -hmm. they by and large get along pretty well. Uh, there will be some things that develop later on more, you know, towards Chick during the Chickamauga campaign. But at this point, you now the, the, the army is seems, seems to be very happy to have Rosecrans in command. Uh, the relationships amongst the, the senior commanders is, is um, pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. And that also will show uh, here at Stones River. Yeah, the uh, the drinking you mentioned. Uh, there's there's a diary of a uh, Kentucky officer, Union Kentucky officer, and one of the things that I kept noticing, and he it's a wonderful diary, where he just gives these great little tidbits of things that he does every day, and during the campaign, and maybe and I think maybe a little bit after and into Tullahoma campaign the amount of drinking that goes on just, it floored me. I mean, mm -hmm. it seemed about every night, every other night, he was talking about, we'd go to such off the fast and loose here. What would you expect out of a bunch of 20 something year old men? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's what he said. We go to so and so's tent, we drink, <laughs> play cards, and he would yep. do this to the wee hours of the morning. And then next day, he'd do his yeah. duty. And, we, we, we've entrusted, 50,000 20 year olds with guns and no, no not a whole lot of oversight from the women folks so what are they going to yep. do they're going to drink they're going to swear they're going to whore around they're going to play cards they're going to get into trouble mm -hmm. and every once in a while they'll fight the war yeah and speaking of that what was it um it and i think i'm thinking about rosecrans here uh did did he like to swear quite a bit <laughs> or was that somebody else in the uh, upper levels of the army? Well, I, I I'd say Thomas J. Wood was the most creative swearer in the army of the Cumberland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> certainly was very skilled at it. Rosecrans had a mercurial temperament mm -hmm. uh, such that he would blow his stack and say something pretty harsh and then five minutes later come back and apologize. Right. Um, uh, he was a very devoted Catholic, and I, I, I think the the swearing was something he constantly struggled with. It's kind it of Patton-esque a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> it, it was, I don't think something that, you know, if he's down there looking upon us today, it would be like, ah, why are you guys talking? That was <laughs> something I, it was something he struggled with. You're right. Um, but yeah, he, he too, and, and you know, one of the Rosecrans's uh, you know, uh, idiosyncrasies, shall we say, was in moments of, of excitement, uh, his uh, ability to speak and make himself understood became very challenging. He would he would tend to stutter, mm -hmm. and 
he would get so excited such that people couldn't understand what he was saying. And this certainly becomes more problematic, you know, we'll see during the Chickamauga campaign, especially where, you know, he loses his stack several times. Mm -hmm. uh, the advantage he has during this period is he has Julius Garrache as his chief of staff, and they were about as tight as brothers. Uh, Garrache had a unique talent for deciphering, well, we'll call it Rosecrans ease, and turning it into actionable orders that the rest of the army understood. His, his written orders are masterpieces of elocution. They, they, they may, and like I said, Rosecrans, I got the sense was kind of a, a, a bit of a mad scientist. He was extremely intelligent, mm -hmm. but I think he kind of ping ponged all over the place sometimes. Garrache knew how to take the various ping pongs and put it into a command order yeah. that the rest of the army understood. And the loss of Garrache at Stones River was, was it didn't impact the immediate battle itself, but it, it led to the onset, you know, uh, Garfield coming out. And Garfield was no Garrache. That's one mm -hmm. of my favorite sayings. Garfield, for all his qualities, was no Garrache. And he had his own uh, agenda, as, you know, we mm -hmm. find out in later years with, you know, as far as, you know, sending things to the War Department and to Stanton. Uh, undercutting his own chief. Uh, Garrache never would have done that, in my mm -hmm. opinion. He was thoroughly devoted to Rosecrans, and that was a, really a major component of Rosecrans' uh, success. Uh, but, you know, the way that he treated men like Garrache, the rest of the staff saw that. I mean, it, it was kind of a, a warm, he had kind of a warm military family. Um, a, a lot of center on, on faith. Um but yeah, Rose, Rosecrans had his challenges with swearing, but you know, extremely devoted to prayer and, and to God. I mean, he was he was a, a, a godly man, mm -hmm. um, a man of faith. And I don't know what else to say about it. He, yeah. uh, you know, we we all have our times where we fail. Yeah, for sure. So we are uh, nearing, I guess, about an hour here on this uh, this first little bit here on Stones River, which. Mm -hmm. The, we we've got a lot there as you can tell there is a lot a lot to discuss on the battle of stones river we haven't even talked With, about anything uh, we haven't even talked about the battle yet right really. there's there's so much to set up it. yeah and one thing i guess one last question i want to ask before we uh wrap up this particular part mm -hmm. is it safe to say that going into stones river uh, just for you know, for somebody that maybe isn't following the Western theater very much, is it safe to say that the Army of Tennessee at this point in the war is more battle hardened than the Army of the Cumberland, or uh, what becomes the Army of the Cumberland yeah. at this in point? In, in, it is a broad general statement, yes, but in pockets, yes, and in pockets, no. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were certainly some very battle-hardened troops in the Army of the Cumberland. There's been troops that had fought in, in the far west at Pea Ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these troops had fought at Shiloh. Some of them had fought at, at, at Perryville. Not a lot of them, but some of them had fought. At, some of them fought all the way back at Mill Springs on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I'd say, yeah, the Army of Tennessee is, is had a little more combat exposure in general, mm -hmm. but it's also in part because there's not quite as many of them. Right. Uh, they haven't had a whole lot of choice in the matter. And, and some of the combat exposure these men have had has not been beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, there was troops there that were, as I said, Mill Springs was a, a quite a disaster for the Confederate Army. But there were troops in the Confederate Army that were at Stones River that that was kind of their, their uh, coming out party. And it wasn't a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Don it's some Fort Donaldson veterans as well. Uh, another another instance where you know, the Confederate Army fought well, but it was a, it was a defeat. Um, I suppose that can be a learn that defeat certainly maybe or maybe better learning experiences than victories. Um, but yeah, I'd say in general, a little more battle hardened. Um, but you know, when I look at the army of Tennessee at Stones River, it's in good condition overall from the standpoint that the troops are well supplied. Uh, they, they, these aren't the ragged Confederates that, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, you think of Valley Forge with the men wrapping their, their feet in, in, yeah. in cloths. I mean, they, they, they generally had proper clothing. Uh, they were all armed. 
the Confederate Army was still very much in the transition phase, moving from, uh, shall we say, flint locks and smooth bores towards rifles. The Army at this point has kind of a mix of both. Uh, you see accounts where, you know, within a regiment themselves, they, there would be a mix of arms. Um, under a fairly good state of, of discipline, with the exception of the cavalry arm, which is something we'll talk about later, the, the Confederate cavalry in, in discipline uh, almost kind of exist outside of one another. It's just a, a lot of problems with, with, with uh, maintaining discipline there. But, you know, by and large, I think the condition of the Army was, was pretty good. Uh, you look at the morale of the men. Um, they felt that they had won the Battle of Perryville. They mm -hmm. weren't quite. They didn't quite understand why they had left Kentucky, but they didn't hold themselves accountable for it. It mm -hmm. wasn't. Well, we failed because the the forty fifth Mississippi are a bunch of cowards. No, they 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 figured it. You know, they. I won't say they gave Bragg a pass because they didn't. They certainly weren't. They were browsing about it, but they didn't. It wasn't a. Um, wasn't one of those events where the army started to doubt itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these men were devoted to this cause. They knew they could fight. They knew under proper leadership they could fight uh, extremely well. And they're about to prove that here at Stones River. So I, I'd say the army and Davis himself, when he comes to, to um, Murfreesboro in, in December, is very impressed with the physical condition and the spirit of this army as he reviews them. Now, granted, it's a review. You're going to get to see the best of the best. But, you know, Davis had seen, you know, he's certainly seen the army in Northern Virginia. He's very familiar with that. And he came away with him. He came away impressed with the condition of this army as he saw it two mm -hmm. weeks before the battle. Yeah. No reason in my mind to think that that would degrade in two weeks. The, the, the army that fought at Stones River was in good physical shape, good spirit, mm -hmm. good morale, reasonably well armed, reasonably well supplied. They, 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 they had what they needed to get their job done. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point that you make, that Davis had visited both armies, and, you know, to come away impressed and confident that they're in good shape, I, I think that I think that speaks a lot. Well, as and, and it, 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 part of the problem that, that Bragg ran into is after, he, you know, we mentioned he visited Richmond in October of 62 to explain the issues with the Kentucky campaign, uh, Edmund Kirby Smith and Lionitis Polk came and spoke with Davis as well. And Polk was pretty, uh, uh, pretty damning in his comments about Bragg, basically said the efficiency of the army was being destroyed. Bragg was incompetent. And Davis shows up here, you know, we'll say a month later. And what he was expecting to see based on Polk's report was the polar opposite of what he's seeing yeah. in front of him. Yeah. And at some point I got to wonder that Davis like, uh, Oh, you weren't really telling me the true story here. What's going on? I don't know if you ever came to that conclusion or not. But, yeah, he was expecting to come and see this army. It was all bedraggled and poor morale and whatnot. And what he saw was quite the opposite. Right. Well, I think that is a great place to pause uh, until we get to uh, another, I guess, part two on Stones River here. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, you know, just talking civil war western theater civil war is just uh it's, it's always fun for me uh whether it's at a bull session after one of the tours at perryville or richmond uh or just right here doing that digitally it's it's always been a blast and i can always talk stones river i just love listening to everything about that um thank you so, so much for the invite yeah for sure and you, you can expect several more i'll just put it that way <laughs> all right yeah. That concludes part one of our discussion on the Battle of Stones River with author and historian Dan Masters. And if you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe and drop us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts, as doing so helps our show become more visible in searches and on other platforms. Be sure to visit us at westerntheatercivilwar.com and find WTCW on social media. You can follow us on Twitter or X by searching for at Western Theater and join in on the many conversations currently going on in our Facebook group. There, you, the listener and fellow Western Theater student, can post about all the amazing things you are currently learning and ask questions from the dozens of experts in the group. We like to think that there is no better Civil War group on Facebook. 
You can find us on other social medias, including Instagram, by searching at Kentucky Civil War. There you can find my Instagram page where I post things about not only Kentucky's role in the Civil War, but also plenty on the Western Theater. So be sure to drop us that rating, follow us on social media, and catch us next time for part two on the Battle of Stones River.